Good afternoon. I should start by saying I am proudly a geek. <laughs> and what I'm going to talk today about is something that is very important for everybody to understand, which is what are these kids doing? And particularly, what are they doing on social media? So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to describe the different generations of kids in our world now, most of which you probably have or understand. I'm going to talk about this issue of communicating, most of which is not happening face to face like we are now, but is happening behind glass screens, and that is changing everything. Obviously, you can't talk about social media without talking about Facebook. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some myths and realities about social networking and followed up with a model of parenting. So let me start by talking about generations, because the baby boomer generation started in the mid-1940s and ended in the mid-1960s. And if you notice, that's about 18, 19 years. Then Generation X lasted from the 60s to the late 70s. Then we follow with the net generation, a group that grew up with the internet as its most important feature, born in the 80s, and now you notice that our generations are getting shrinking smaller and smaller and smaller. And then we get what we call the I generation, obviously after iPhones, iPods, Wii's, anything that has a little I in it, born in the 90s. And now we're already starting in our research to look at what we're calling Generation C. C for creative, communicative, collaborative, collegial. And these are all the kids that are born in the new millennium. By the way, as long as we're talking about geeks, I should mention that my major computer consultant is 10 years old. And that may sound funny, and it may sound facetious, but if I have a computer question, I will email Mikey, and I will say, Mikey, can you help me with this? And he will email me back a very literate email and say, Larry, that's a very good question. And if you want the answer, how about if you click this link, it will give you the answer. And if you have any further questions, please ask me. <laughs> and I trust him because he's almost always right. So a couple of cartoons to give you an idea of these new generations. On the left, the teacher saying, what did I do on my holidays? And the student saying, can't I just email you a link to my blog teacher? <laughs> and on the right, the first smile, the first wave, the first steps, and of course, the first text message. <laughs> this list is all very common things in our world, and none of them existed before the year 2000. Is it any wonder that our world is changing so rapidly? Another way to look at this, consumer researchers use a metric called penetration rate. When some technology reaches 50 million people, that's called penetrating society. So for those of us like me, baby boomers, any other baby boomers in the audience? OK, so for all of us baby boomers, we remember radio and telephone taking 38 years, around 20-something years, television slowly filtering into society, giving us enough time to really understand it and make sense of it. And now you look and see some of these things. Instant messaging took a couple of years, all the way down to Facebook a couple of years, YouTube one year, and Angry Birds reached 50 million users in 35 days. 35 days. You hardly have time to react to something that takes 35 days to penetrate society. And let's face it, kids are different. I don't know if you get this comic strip, but this is my absolute favorite comic strip, so I'm sorry you're going to have to see several of them. This is Jeremy. Jeremy is perennially 16 years old and baffling his mother and father. And his mother says, Jeremy, why did you get a D on your chemistry test? Because I couldn't study for it. You couldn't study for it? Why? because my iPod battery was dead, at which point then she just stares at him and he says, you can't study with an iPod, mom. And she says, yes, but Mendeleev managed to organize the periodic table. We also know that our students, our youngsters, are multitasking all the time. And Jeremy's dad says, hey, Jeremy, what are you watching? And Jeremy says, on which screen? <laughs> because he's got his phone, his laptop, and his television. So we have done research, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to regale you with a lot of research. I'm going to do it in a, in a condensed fashion, and I'm going to try to make it make total sense. So this is one study where we asked people of various ages, ranging from Gen C up to Baby Boomer, how many things they think they can do at the same time. And you'll notice that the older folks say, well, they can do four, four and a half, and it's mostly things like eating, reading, watching television all at the same time. The younger kids, the parents tell us, they can do a few things, but look at this. 
Look at the teenagers, the 16 to 8 year olds, seven things they think they can do at the same time. I'll talk in a minute about whether that's true. <laughs> This comic, no comment on this. I did not, by the way, take either of these pictures. <laughs> and communication patterns are very different. And if you have children, you will understand this. Jeremy's phone is ringing and mom says, Jeremy, why aren't you answering your phone? Ah, it's probably nothing. How do you know? What if it's important? If it was important, they'd text me. <laughs> and I can tell you I have texted my children often because I phoned them and they don't answer their phone and they don't return their phone calls. And my daughter's iPhone, where it has the little icon for how many phone messages you have, just has like dots because there's a billion. She never answers the phone. So how do these generations communicate? If you ask each members of each generation their preferred communication modality, us baby boomers, our first is face-to-face, -face, then we prefer the phone, and then email. Same with Gen Xers, but now when you get down into the generations that are defined by the computer and technology, you find that the net generation prefers face-to-face -face first, but texting second. And the I generation, texting is their number one way that they would choose to communicate with their friends. Number two is instant messaging, Facebook, and the phone, and a distant third is face-to-face. You know the Nielsen Company? The Nielsen Company does research on who watches what television shows. And they also look at text messaging. So this is a chart of text messages starting in 2007 up to 2009. The orange line shows text messages by teenagers per month. This is text sent and received. Watch this, text messages. In 2011, the average teenager sent and received 3,417 text messages a month, unless you're a girl, and then it was almost 4,000. <laughs> Notice that monthly phone calls, they're making only about 196 phone calls compared to four, almost 4,000 text messages a month. And obviously we can't talk about kids without talking about social media. And here's our old social networking and here is our new social networking. And of course we have several social networks that are the main social networks. MySpace, dead, gone. It was amazing when it lasted. One in seven people worldwide have a Facebook page and most of them use it every day. Every single day. Facebook is the third largest country in the world. And these last two statistics always blow my mind. One out of every four minutes on the internet is spent on Facebook. One out of every four minutes. And if you believe that's just sort of idle time, one out of every five page views on the internet is viewing Facebook. It is omnipresent, it is the most important thing. And if we look at the different generations, we see that the generations who use Facebook multiple times a week, the, the, the net generation, those young adults are using it, and the I generation. But if you look at what they do there, what you see is they're mostly doing sort of teenage things. They're posting status updates to tell people about them. This person says, my driver's license picture is still a hot mess. This person says, do you think Ben is cute? Do you think Ben is funny? Do you think Ben is a good athlete? Trying to get people to comment. And so who is posting these status updates? Well, it's mostly the young adults and the teenagers who are doing this almost all the time. They're also posting lots of information about themselves. And lest we think that Facebook is just sort of a waste of time of people talking, it's not. It's a mirror of the teenager, the young adult, even the older adult like me, of our relationship with the world. It's really what psychologists would call displaying our sense of self, who we are. So the person on the left says, campus tour guide for Yale University, work for the National Park Service, has favorite quotations, favorite music. The, this younger person on the right is still in high school, talks about who are the people that inspire him, who are his favorite baseball teams and football teams. It's all about changing and saying, who am I, what do I do? And of course, 
we've now changed the concept of friend forever because this girl is sitting by herself eating and she says she's got pr plenty of friends but they're all online. And of course, we've now redefined the term unfriending, which by the way is in the dictionary. Unfriending is really an official word in the dictionary. And what it means is being removed as a friend from Facebook. So let me talk a little bit about some of the myths and realities of Facebook use. By the way, I do notice that this is a pill bottle that says seek help at www.facebookaddicts.com.au. So myth number one, technology means the same thing to everyone. Did a research study where we took more than 3,000 adults, teens, and children, and we asked them questions about what they do, what they use, how much technology they use, why they use it, and what we were able to do was to find groupings of similar technologies for different generations. So we're gonna take the baby boomers first. The first group of technologies are being on the computer, just doing computer things, not being online. Sending and receiving email, being online, and Facebook for this generation is all part of being on the computer. Notice in the middle you've got television and video games, we call those sort of couch potato activities. And then you've got texting and music. Now watch what happens when you look at Gen X. Watch the red, where does the Facebook move? Facebook is now a communication tool for this generation. It's part and parcel of texting, phone calls, and communicating through social media. How about the net generation? Well now for the net generation, we find this big group of activities, being online, being on the computer, doing email, instant messaging, listening to music, and Facebook. It's a totally different experience for them. And if you now look at the I generation, these teenagers, Facebook is now, again, part and parcel of talking, communicating. And we also ask the parents to answer for their little young Gen C kids. And so what do you think their structure looks like? Basically, in their world, there are only two things. There are video games and television or couch potato activities and everything else. So this generation that we're raising, these young kids, they don't see technology as a tool. They see technology the same way we see air. We don't walk outside and go, oh yeah, there's air today, I can breathe. The kids don't walk outside and say, oh, t I have a tool of technology. It's part of them, it lives inside them, it is what defines them. So myth number two, using technology is bad for your health. We did a research study where we talked to a tad more than a thousand parents and we asked them questions about how the kids ate, what they ate, what kind of technology they used, what their health was like, both their physical health, their mental health, their psychological health, their attitudes, their behaviors, and we were interested in looking at did technology impact health in any way? So what we found was those children, young children who used more media had worse health across the board. Mental health, psychological health, physical health, behavioral problems, attitudinal problems. For pre-teenagers, again, those who used more media were more unhealthy, but in particular it was video game playing that made them unhealthy. When you get to teenagers, it's pretty much everything. More media, more time online, more video game playing. Another study, is Facebook itself bad for you? And this is a study that, that's dear to my heart because it's the most recent one that I've done and it's the one that is in the book that I wrote. And so I wanna spend a little bit of time explaining to you what I did. We administered a measure to nearly 800 people ranging from teenagers to adults. And it was a very long, complicated survey, but what it did is it came out with a list of signs and symptoms of psychological disorders. So things like obsessive compulsive disorder, narcissism, depression, schizophrenia. And what, it, what we did is we looked to see if people who use more technology showed more of those signs and symptoms. So what's your guess? Well, I'm gonna show you a chart that lists some of the disorders on the side, narcissism, depression, mania, half of bipolar disorder, avoidant behavior, histrionic behavior, compulsive behavior, schizoid, delusional, antisocial, and sadistic, and we have 
predictors here. Daily Facebook use, how much do you use Facebook every day? Facebook impression management, how do you use Facebook to put yourself out? Remember those pictures of, you know, I work for the National Park Service, I like this baseball team, I love this kind of music, that's impression management. And then friends, how many friends do you have on Facebook? For each disorder, we ask the question, what are the best predictors of people who have that disorder? For narcissism, number one predictor, more friends you have, the more narcissistic you are. More friends you have, the more narcissistic you are. Do you know people have lots of friends on Facebook? What do they post? Me, 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 look what I did today. Look what I had for breakfast. The only way I know what my children are doing is I read their Facebook page. Uh, my youngest son posts what he had for breakfast, when he stopped for coffee, what he had for lunch, what he's cooking for dinner, what television shows he's watching that night. It seems very narcissistic, doesn't it? Facebook impression management also tends to make you more narcissistic and just your daily use. Just notice the ones, twos, and threes here. Facebook is the top predictor of every single psychiatric disorder, either number one, number two, number three, and there's a little one in red here. For depression, turns out that those people who have more Facebook friends are less depressed. So there is a positive benefit of having friends on Facebook. It makes you less depressed. So myth four, there's no such thing as virtual empathy. We did a study where we were looking at the concept of empathy. You know what empathy is, right? Empathy is when people, you say, oh, I'm having a bad day, and somebody will talk to you, they'll help you, they might give you a hug. They do something to make you feel better. The question is, can you have virtual empathy? Meaning, can you display empathy online without being in front of someone? What happens on your birthday? How many people have a Facebook page? What happens on your birthday? You get lots of happy birthday wishes, right? Now, are they spontaneous? No. How do you know when it's somebody's birthday on Facebook? On the side of the page, it says, today is Larry's birthday. <laughs> and if you want to wish Larry a happy birthday, click right here. How easy is that, right? But I can tell you that most people on their birthday feel really excited because they get 50 happy birthdays and 200 likes, all of which is really a form of empathy. It's a form of kindness. This lady, I love this cartoon. This lady says, what a bummer. I'm getting about twice as many dislikes as likes on my Facebook concerning my desire to get a refill on coffee. And this concept of like is very important. Um, on every single post, on every single picture on Facebook, on anything on Facebook that's there, you have an option of commenting or very simply clicking like. You can also click dislike too, but clicking like. And like turns out to be a very important action, particularly for young kids. 62% of Facebookers click like at least once a week, but for the I generation, 83% of them do, and for the young adults in the net generation, 77% do. So you're looking at something that has a meaning. So what do we find in our study? First of all, obviously, virtual empathy is real. It is a real phenomenon. Is it any good? Well, it turns out that if you get more virtual empathy from people, you feel more supported. You also feel more supported, obviously, if you get more real-world empathy, more hugs, more, ooh, ooh, I'm so sorry for you. And in fact, it turns out that real-world empathy is about six times more important than virtual empathy. Virtual empathy is still good, but it's not enough. A real hug is what you really need. It turns out that those people who spend more time on Facebook are better at being empathic, both in the virtual world and in the real world. It's as though they're practicing how to be empathic. And that's particularly important for teenagers, and we're starting to study this. So what is it about this behind the screen network that allows a shy teenager, somebody who's not very good at communicating, to be able to type an empathic statement to somebody else and have it be meaningful and practice this skill? And it turns out practicing on Facebook translates into the real world. 
The interesting one to me is those people who play more video games actually are less empathic in the real world, but not on Facebook. So the fact that they're enmeshed in a video gaming environment still allows them to practice empathy, but it doesn't, for them, it doesn't translate to the real world. So what does it mean for social networking? Well, it turns out that the best predictors of those people who are better at empathy are those people who spend more time on Facebook. You practice it, you get better at it. So the last myth, Facebook makes you multitask, which is bad. Is it bad to multitask? Well, first of all, you heard Judy Willis talk earlier about neuroscience and the brain, and in fact, we don't multitask. If you look at our brains, we are not multitasking. What our brains are doing is focusing on one task, oops, something else happens, I'm gonna focus on another task, and back to this task, and back to this task. We are task switching back and forth and back and forth. Do professionals do it? Yes. Research studies with computer programmers show that they focus about three minutes before switching to another task. Researchers with medical students show that they focus about three minutes before switching to another task. That scares me. I don't think I want my doctor focusing for only three minutes before, oops, I better focus on this organ now because, no, I don't think you want that to happen. So let me describe what's happening. We tend to worry more about distractions that happen outside. If somebody coughs out there, I'm distracted. If I move like this, you're distracted. But distractions come from both outside and inside. And in my lab, I'm much more concerned about what's coming from the inside, and I'll show you why. We did a study where we looked at students while they were studying, and we took nearly 300 students, said, let us into your home, let us watch you study. And so they sat there and we sat behind them and we observed and we gave them time to practice getting used to us being there. And what we did is every single minute we marked down what they were doing. Long list, we marked down exactly what they were doing at that minute. The point was to see, first of all, can they stay on task? Are they as bad as computer programmers? Are they as bad as medical students? Can they stay on task? And second of all, if they can't, what distracts them? So, on the left is how much they're staying on task. On the bottom are minutes one through 15. So, for the first couple of minutes, they're on task, and they're kind of focused. Then after about three minutes, they start to get distracted. Then, they focus again, then something magical happens at around the eight, nine, 10 minute and they get more distracted. Remember eight, nine, 10 minutes because that's very important. And then they focus again. So what's happening? Well, one of the things we did is we watched their computer screen and we counted how many windows they had open on their computer screen. Look at the number of windows creeping up and it creeps up right at about the eight, nine and 10 minute mark. They continue to open more windows as they're studying. They continue to distract themselves. And what we asked then was, can we use their studying behavior to predict whether they're good students or not? So, and we, we did it very simply. We asked them, what's your grade point average? Very simple. So we had high school students, middle school students, college students, what's your grade point average? And we asked the question, what best predicts if you'll be a good student? So the good news is, those who stayed on task more, who were able to stretch it not just three minutes, but four minutes, five minutes, six minutes, even 15 minutes for some, were better students. Those who had strategies for studying that knew how to study were better students. Now the bad news, those who prefer to switch from task to task more often were worse students. Those who consume more media were worse students, and if they check Facebook once, just once, during the 15 minutes, they were worse students. So they're being distracted from within. Their brain is yelling at them, check Facebook, somebody might have commented, somebody might have posted, I don't wanna miss out, somebody might have liked that picture that I put up. So they're being distracted. We are also becoming obsessed with technology, and the obsession is very clear. We ask people, how often do you check your phone? The iGeneration checks text messaging every 15 minutes or less. 
Cell phone calls every 15 minutes or less. I want to focus on Facebook here. One third of the young teenagers and young adults check Facebook every 15 minutes or less, and three quarters of them check it every hour or less. How do they do that? It's in their pocket. They're carrying it with them. They're checking it all day long and they're carrying it with them. And what happens is they get anxious if they can't check in. If they can't check Facebook, they get very anxious at not being able to check in. So, what is it all about? Well, I really think it's about parenting and I think it's about parenting style. We all need to learn how to parent this very weird and unique generation that we don't quite understand. And the best parenting style is what's called an authoritative parenting style. This is a parenting style that uses a model called the talk model of parenting. The talk model of parenting says that there are four major aspects of being a good parent. One is trust. You have to start building up trust with your kids from day one. Because if they don't trust you, then they will do things about technology that are not good. The second part is assess. You have to know what your kids are doing. You don't have to be brilliant at it, you just have to know what they're doing. Learn is you have to learn a little bit about the technologies. You don't have to tweet, but you have to know what Twitter is. You don't have to be a Facebook friend of your kid, but you have to know what Facebook is. And then the K is for communicate, and I know communicate starts with a C. I understand that, but if, if the model was T-A-L-C, that sounds sort of like baby powder, and that doesn't make a good model. <laughs> so the bottom line is, it's about parenting. You can't stop the kids from using the technology. What you have to do is parent them through it. You have to get them to develop a trust with you so that they trust you enough to come talk to you when there are problems. And the last is a mom talking to the dad and says they want us to monitor our kids' internet use. Says that's a bit like asking cavemen to monitor the 20th century use of the wheel. So thank you very much, and I appreciate your time.